you would turn in your Bibles to the passage that Peyton read for us for the scripture reading in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. You'll notice within the text that we read earlier, beginning there in verse 11 and reading down through verse 13, the basic summary of this is that the Lord has equipped us with what we need so that we may grow. So that not only will we as individuals grow, look at verse 13, the phrase, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, but that the whole body will grow, in verse 16, being joined and knit together by what every joint supplies. Now, what is interesting when you talk about growth, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. You talk about growth, growth is a very interesting thing because sometimes growth is very difficult to ascertain depending on the field or the area that you're talking about. Um, sometimes it may be easier to observe someone else's growth or lack of growth than it may be even our own. I mean, you think about children. When you live with your children every day, I mean, you do recognize their growth from time to time, but if, you, if you're someone, family member, that see, hasn't seen them in a while, then you see how much they've grown. It's amazing. It's easy to tell. It's, it's easy to chart. When I was growing up, the, the house my grandmother lived in, there was a, a molding on a door facing that I remember as a kid, every time we'd go up there, you'd stand up beside it, and they'd put a little pencil mark, you know, and, and put your name in the date of that, you know. And so, why, although there was some remodeling done in the house, they made sure to keep up with that chart of growth because a lot of kids' names were written on that. So it, it, it's, it's interesting and important at times, depending on what we're talking about, to be able to, to make sure that we are charting our growth, that we are rating our growth. The thing is, though... The challenge, I think, sometimes for us as Christians is being able to look within our own lives and to determine what level of growth we're at, where we're at in whatever given area it may be in talking about serving as Christians. Um, like I said, it, it, sometimes it may be easier to look at other people, but what about ourselves? And you would think that it would be easier for us to be true judges of ourselves. But sometimes we might have a hard time distinguishing between where we think we are or where we wish we were from where we actually are at. And so what we're going to do tonight is we're going to put forth the lesson entitled Rating Your Spiritual Growth. Rating Your Spiritual Growth. And what we're going to do is look at four, five key areas that we as Christians have to grow in. Now, one of the areas we're not going to talk about is faith. What we'll talk about here in just a moment directly affects our faith. And what we'll find is that if we grow in these areas, then our faith is going to be as it should be. And faith is directly connected with these areas. And so, yes, our faith is to grow, but it's not really a feeling. It is a trust. It is a persuasion. It is a conviction and if we rate ourselves properly and we are truly growing as we should, then faith will be where it needs to be. Now, let's step past. Here's what we just talked about by way of the introduction there. And we'll talk about, I've got four areas there. I think I modified it right at the last. And there's five areas. Who knows? We'll see when we get to the end of it. I took out one area, added another one, split it in two. So I'm not sure if we're up to six now. But let's continue, though. I'm talking about growth there for a moment. Let's begin with knowledge and understanding of God's word. If we were to talk, if, if you were to rate, I'm not going to rate your growth, but if you were to rate your growth or I was to rate my growth in the area of Bible knowledge, how would you, how would you rate yourself? Think about that for a moment. When an individual becomes a Christian, they are, as we often refer to them as, a new convert. And Peter points the desire of a new convert in the proper, proper direction. Notice first off, 1 Peter chapter 1, the latter part of it, Peter introduces this idea to us or reminds us of the fact that we're all born again. 
And specifically, in 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning there in verse 22, he says, Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the, through the Spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible through the Word of God which lives and abides forever. So when an individual becomes a Christian, they are born again. There is this new birth concept they are, as it were, a babe in Christ. And so it, it, makes, it makes perfect sense that Peter then would continue on into chapter 2 in verse 1 as it's divided for us and say, therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. So when an individual becomes a Christian, well, I was going to say when an individual becomes a Christian, they should desire to know more about the Word of God. Really, your desire to know more about the Word of God begins before you ever become a Christian. And because that's where the whole conviction process begins. There's an interest, there's a spark. Someone sits down and talks to you about sin and the, and the consequence of sin and, and, and the, the, the redemption of sin. And so they pique your interest and you begin to study. And that study builds up within you a conviction that you need to turn away from sin and, and obey the gospel's call unto salvation. You've already began the, the, the pursuit of knowledge and the growth of knowledge. Now it's built up enough conviction within you that you obey the gospel's call and salvation and you now become a babe in Christ and as a result you should continue therefore then to desire and in this case you desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. It's talking about those elements of the word of God that's crucial to one's growth as a Christian. Those things that we need to know sometimes referred to as first principles, fundamental foundations that we cannot live without. We could talk about it being the death of Christ upon the cross of Calvary. We could talk about the, the organization of the local church, the work of the local church, the, the, the body of Christ and its establishment when Jesus died on the day of Pentecost. It, just so many things that are crucial within that milk of the word that helps to establish within us a foundation that is equipped for growing. And as a result, we then, with the proper nourishment at the beginning, we continue to seek to grow. The Apostle Paul, in writing to the church at Corinth, notice with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, in the first four verses there. He writes, 1 Corinthians 3 verse 1, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. These, this church may have been around, this congregation, some five or six years at this point. You can grow a lot as a Christian in five or six years with the proper study and the proper desires. But they were still babes in Christ. He had to speak to them as babes in Christ. He says in verse 2, I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able, for you are still carnal. For are there are envy, strife, and divisions among you. Are you not carnal, behaving like mere men? You know, and he continues there with, with the point within this particular section. The problem is, they were to grow. They should have sought this growth. But as it were, they were still babes in Christ. And so we understand that as Christians, we need to be growing in knowledge. It's not enough to go to services once a week or even every time the doors open and listen to a few hours a week of the Word of God being presented. I mean, there was a time in our history that preachers would have gone an hour plus. You know, and, and interestingly enough, historically, the Tenth and Francis congregation, you go back, could we say two generations from where we're at today, go back to Tenth and Francis, back when they bought the original location and assembled in the, the old white building that was there and then tore it down and built another one, most denominations and the church there at Tenth and Francis met at 7 o'clock Sunday evening. You know, I hear people say, well, our, our Sunday evening services came about as a result of World War II, women having to go to work and everything. Listen, they were meeting at 7 o'clock Sunday evenings back 1918, 1920, 1922. I mean, all throughout Oklahoma City, different, different churches met at the time. Tenth and Francis, once they got out of the courthouse to that new location, they met. So, and, and it probably wouldn't have been a surprising thing for the preachers to have gone an hour at that point. But even then, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, it's not enough. 
It's not enough if that's all the digesting of the Word of God that we receive. We need to study it on a daily basis. We need to study it regularly so that we might continue to grow and reach this point of maturity. The Hebrew writer reprimands the recipients of this letter for their lack of growth. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12, he says, you know, by this time, and this is going to be a paraphrase of it. He says, you know, enough time has passed that you should be teaching. But you, you still need someone to come and teach you again the first principles of God's word. Now think about that for a moment. We're not talking about going back to, to, to the elementary class and saying, you know, you ought to be old enough and know enough to be teaching by now, but you're not. Shame on you. No, he's talking to Christians, adults, individuals who have known the Word of God long enough that they should have been able to have taught people. But he said, but you're in need of the first principles of the oracles of God. What's up with that? I mean, you've been Christians long enough. The first principles should be part and intermixed with that foundation, but you've forgotten it. Your foundation is weak. He says, everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. It's okay to be a babe when you're one year old, two years old, three years old. That's okay. But when you're 25, 26, 27, 48, 49, 60, it's not okay to be a babe any longer. And we wouldn't accept that in our life. I mean, how many of you, if your 10-year-old was acting like a baby, would sit there and, and stand for that? I mean, the best thing you say is bend over, let's get that diaper changed. I mean, you're going to act like a baby, let's treat you like a baby. But for those of us who are Christians, and we've been Christians long enough to be able to handle the Word of God properly, it would be a shame on us if all we could handle was the milk of the Word. Solid food belongs to those who are of full age, verse 14 says. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. 2 Timothy 2.15, Paul talks about the need to rightly handle the word of truth. To rightly be able to understand it and use the word of truth. And the only way that we'll reach that level of maturity is through diligence. It's through diligence in being diligent in our pursuit to know the Word of God. Not what our parents have said about the Word of God, but what we learn ourselves as we study it. Teachers are good. Teachers are beneficial. But at some point it can't be, well, it, this means this because um, Bill said it was. It's got to be this says this means this because it's what the Bible says. This is what it means. So if you were to rate your growth in the area of Bible knowledge and understanding from 1 to 10, how would you rate yourself? Now, you got to be honest about it. We have to be honest in this evaluation or else we deceive ourselves. There's a lot of individuals in the world today who know some about God's Word and think they know everything about the Word of God. But we have to understand that we've got to be true about this and admit when, yeah, there are passages we don't understand. There are questions we have that we've not been able to answer yet. But we continue studying. We continue to persevere. But let's continue. That's the growth in the area of Bible knowledge. Let's look at another area wherein we need to be growing, and that is in the area of overcoming sin. How have you been doing in overcoming sin? Think back to the last week of your life, last year of your life, I guess. Go even farther. Go back to when you became a Christian. You know, the longer you live as a Christian, the stronger you should become, and, and the more you should be able to overcome sin. But how are we doing? We need to understand, of course, how sin develops. This is a big part in our being able to overcome sin. Turn with me to James chapter 1 for a moment. James chapter 1, passage we've looked at quite often, but let's begin there in verse 12. The writer says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he'll receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. The enduring of temptation here means to overcome. He's not talking about blessed the man who's tempted five times a day and five times a day gives in to the temptation. 
It's talking about the one who endures, who overcomes. All right? He will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Now, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. So, isn't that a very simple concept? Every man is drawn, sin occurs when every man is drawn away. Drawn away from where he should be. Drawn away by sin. And then he chooses to give in to that sin. The sin, that desire gives birth to sin. That sin yields a spiritual separation from God. That's death. That's how sin occurs. I mean, you're not going to be walking along one day and all of a sudden, without any knowledge, without any preparation, without any warning, you're now guilty of sin. Sin occurs when we're drawn away by our desires. We know it's wrong, we don't care it's wrong, but that moment we're drawn away and we do what God has told us not to do. Now here's the thing about it. We know that God wants us to overcome sin. I mean, this is the reason why he sent Jesus to die upon the cross of Calvary. The idea of him being the, the redemptive price for our sin, the, the buyback to, to, to purchase us back, if you would, the, the redemption of our sins. So he's gone to great lengths so that he is able in his great justness to forgive us of our sins. So what does he want us to do once our sins have been forgiven? Well, he wants us to watch. You know, think about 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 through 9. Why does Peter tell us here that the devil, that the devil goes about like a roaring lion? Why? Why give us this warning? Why say be sober, be vigilant? Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith. Why does Peter tell us this? So that we won't give in to sin. So that we won't be caught off guard. So that we won't be caught at a vulnerable moment and devoured. Instead, we'll be prepared. We will, as verse 9 said there, resist him that is the devil. And remain steadfast in the faith. Over in James chapter 4 verse 7 we see that idea of resisting the devil pictured here as well. James 4 verse 7 he says therefore submit to God. Then he says resist the devil. Then he says he will flee from you. If we resist the devil he will flee from us. It's not a case where the devil's going to torture us until we finally give in to sin. It's a matter of saying no. It's a matter of saying, yes, I'll serve God. No to the devil. Matter of fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, we're told here that with every temptation we face, God in his graciousness and his mercy has provided, a with, provided us with a way of escape. No temptation is overtaking you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. He's telling us here that with every temptation we face, there is this way of escape. Y'all, I mean, how many times back in the late 80s did you see all the commercials that were, you know, against the use of drugs and it was the campaign Just Say No? I mean, that, how complicated of a principle was that? It Just Say No. I mean, your parents know how to do it well. Go ask them to do something. They say no. It's real simple. Just, just say no. Okay. But when it comes to sin, when it's something that we might desire to do, that's when the saying no becomes more difficult. You know, not to pick on parents too much, but when was the last time your mother or father said no about something they wanted to buy for themselves? You know, it just, I mean, that's the way it is. Kids say, hey, can I buy this $49 game? No. Dad says, I need a new phone. I'll pay $49 a month for it. i got to have that. Anyway, there are certain things, though, that we can never agree to, that we must always say no, and this is what we're talking about. 
in our overcoming sin, it does boil down to the simple concept of saying no. We, we're not dumb. You study the Bible, you know what's right. You know what's wrong. As a babe in Christ, you'll continue to learn what's right and what's wrong. We know. So now the key is saying no. But what happens if we do sin? Well, 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 tells us what to do if we sin. Let's turn over there. 1 chapter 1. 1 John, that is, chapter 1, beginning there in verse 7. He says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is a propitiation for our sins, <coughs> and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. So effectively what John is saying, I'm writing these things so that you don't sin. Don't leave God's fellowship. Don't walk in darkness. But if you do, now listen to how simple it is. If you allow yourself to give in sin, you confess the sin unto God. Turn away from the sin, turn back to God. How many sins will God forgive within our lifetime? Every one of them if we turn away. If we confess our sin and genuinely repent and turn back to him, that's the power of the blood of Christ. You know, we talk about all of our past sins washed away. That's right. But even if we sin today, God will forgive us if we're willing to turn away and confess our sins unto him. So on a, one, a scale of 1 to 10, think to yourself, how have you done in your overall efforts of overcoming temptation? You know, you should be better today than you were five years ago, ten years ago. But there are times we have weak moments. Maybe that, you know, messes up the results a little bit. But overall, how would you rate yourself in saying no to sin? But let's continue. What about in the area of how we treat our fellow brethren in Christ? Treating one another, you know. How do we treat one another? Well, Colossians 3, verses 12 through 14, lays down for us the, the necessity of being long-suffering, being willing to suffer long in regards to our relationship towards one another. He says in Colossians 3, verse 12, Therefore, as elect of God... Holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a complaint against another. Even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But of all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. So he really emphasizes in this passage the point of bearing with one another, suffering long with one another, Having the tenderness, the mercies, the kindness, humility, all the ingredients. If you were to say, what is the ingredients to having a good, solid relationship with other Christians? It's it right here. This is it right here. You have to have tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. You've got to be willing to bear with one another. You've got to be willing to forgive one another. And then all these you put on love, which is the bond of perfection. This helps us to understand how we're supposed to treat one another and endure with one another. You know, I, I would love to tell you that every single Christian you meet will be the easiest person to get along with. But we're not in heaven yet, so that's not yet quite the, the rule of thumb. Sometimes we might be difficult to get along with. Someone, sometimes we, you know, God, God will save the stubborn people as well as, as, as the not so stubborn. As long as they're willing to submit to him and serve him, you know, may, maybe they're a little bit, you know, you know, hard to get along with. God still saves them. 
Okay? As long as they're willing to serve him and put him first and do their part, he saves them just as he saves us. And so, as a result, we have the responsibility to bear with one another. Let's talk about that a little bit more, turning over to Ephesians chapter 4. Bearing with one another. I therefore, in Ephesians 4 verse 1, Paul writes, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Some scholars have said that Ephesians and Colossians are kind of parallel uh, epistles here. Uh, because much of what he wrote to the church in Ephesus, he dealt with also in his letter to the church at Colossae. Same issue. And this wasn't the church at Corinth. I mean, some of the things we've read there in the Colossian letter and Ephesians letter, you would expect to find it in the Corinthian letter because they had a lot of problems. But in general, brethren need to be reminded that we must bear with one another. Be, be like-minded, as Paul wrote to the church in Philippi. Be of the same mind toward one another there. Philippians 2 verse 1, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, Philippians 2 verse 2, Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done, through, be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out, not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. This is an amazing concept that helps the local congregation to work and function as it should if we treat one another properly. We won't read all of the context of Romans 12, 9 through 21, but notice the very beginning of it, which lays the necessary foundation for all relationships as brethren in Christ. Romans chapter 12, verse 9, let love be without hypocrisy. There's the foundation of it. Let love be without hypocrisy, and then he continues. And it's a, it's a wonderful passage to help us understand the way that we are to be towards one another. So think about your life, the way you are with other brethren. Don't worry about the way they treat you. That's not important right now. What's important is how you treat them. And so how would you rate yourself? If you would, on a scale of 1 to 10, how would you rate your willingness to be long-suffering with other brethren? But let's continue. What about the area of patience? Someone said, you're going to talk about brethren again? No. Now we're talking about something a little bit different. There's long-suffering towards one another. Now we're talking about patience in serving God. Patience in not giving up. Have you ever done something, found yourself committed to something, or involved in some activity, you, you said to yourself, I wish I could just quit. I wish I could just stop and not finish what I'm doing, go home, go to bed, watch a movie, I don't care, I don't like what I'm doing. And you end up giving up. Well, that's called a lack of patience. And there are certain things in life that we have to have a lot of patience if we're going to endure. And part of that is in serving God. It requires great patience to overcome all the trials that we may face. Difficulties, hardships, hard times, whatever it may be. Notice with me in James chapter 1 there, beginning in verse 2. He says in James 1 verse 2, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Do you see that? It makes us stronger. It builds us up when we are patient in serving God, when we endure in serving God. Someone may think, but is it all worth it? Is it worth what we're going through? Well, here's the thing. God's not going to overlook our faith. He's not going to overlook our endurance. The Hebrew writer makes this promise to the recipients here. Notice in Hebrews chapter 6. Let's begin our reading there. Hebrews chapter 6, we'll start in verse 10. And let's read down through verse 12 and listen to what the Hebrew writer has to say about this. 
He says, for God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love which you have shown toward his name, and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. Through faith, and patience inherit the promise. I mean, isn't it worth it? The answer is yes. If we allow ourselves to faithfully serve God and persevere, then yes, we will be victorious. We will have that eternity with God in heaven. But there were some of the recipients who were in need of endurance. Hebrews chapter 10 Turn over just a couple of pages there in your Bible. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35. There were some of them there who were in need of this endurance. He says there, Therefore do not cast away your confidence, which is great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Are we in need of endurance? Aren't you in need of endurance? What about me? Well, here's the question then. On a scale of 1 to 10, how would you rate your patience in serving the Lord? Have there been situations in doing the right thing you have given up? Have there been situations where you know you should have been more faithful, but due to the circumstances or whatever, you've given up? You know, if, you've been a, if you're a mature Christian, should we not always be patient in serving the Lord? But as John says in talking about sin, if anyone sins, there may be times that we have grown weak. So we repent and we turn back. Think about this for a moment. What other areas could we cover in, the, in a lesson such as this? Think about, look into your own life and, and see if there are areas within your life that maybe if you were to truly rate it by God's standard, you might find yourself coming up short. You know, use the analogy, if you would, for a moment of a measuring stick. Um, or better yet, think about a baby's growth chart. You know, you have a baby. And it's a cute little baby. You take the baby into the doctor, and the doctor measures the length of the baby and the, the, the weight of the baby. And the doctor will say, well, on this average growth chart, here's where your baby's at. Now, sometimes you'll have a baby that will be off the chart, as they say. You know, bigger and heavier than the average kid. Or sometimes they'll be undersized. But, and especially if they're undersized, you're a little bit worried, so you keep going back to the doctor. And finally, when the doctor says, you know what, your, your baby's doing fine, you quit worrying about it. It's a simple concept of a standard of growth. And what do we do with the standard of growth? We measure ourselves by this standard. And the Word of God has become, it is our standard of measurement. And so what we're talking about, the various areas we've looked at this evening, and maybe other areas that you might think about in your service unto God. Remember, you're not the standard. I'm not the standard. Your brethren aren't the standard. God's Word is the standard. I mean, there are some Christians, if you compare themselves by, you can do one good thing a week and you're going to be great. But they're not the standard. And there are other Christians, you may look at them and all that they do and say to yourself, I'll never measure up. They're not the standard. God's word is the standard. And so if there are areas that we've covered tonight or other areas that as a Christian you need to improve in, well, then grow in them. Make the needed improvements. Do better as a child of God. Continue that growth to, towards, towards the, the perfection, the, the maturity, the completeness that God would have of you. If you are a Christian or, or if you're not a Christian, well, what are you waiting for? You need to take the steps tonight to become one of God's children, to put yourself in a position to where you can now be in fellowship with God and begin the growth of a Christian. If you believe that Christ is the Son of God, you're willing to repent of your sins and make that public confession, then let's act upon it tonight. 
and be baptized into Christ so you'll rise up to walk in newness of life. If you're accepted to the gospel's call and invitation, come forward now as we stand and as we sing.